Thank, thanks, thanks for having me here. I'm thrilled to be here and uh, open up God's Word with you. Open up to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. I recently, uh, a few months ago, uh, took a little trip with my family. We live in Los Angeles. We took a short trip down to San Diego. And in San Diego, there's an uh, interesting museum. It is actually a retired aircraft carrier. It's the USS Midway right there in San Diego Bay. The USS Midway was commissioned uh, just a few days after World War II, and it was decommissioned in the early 90s. And like all aircraft carriers, it toured around the sea, or around the world. It was engaged in a number of conf conflicts, but this boat is amazing, uh, amazingly large. It's a thousand feet long. Um, and at any time, there could have been up to 4,500 sailors on the boat, all fulfilling uh, different roles as as it went out to, to protect the United States. And they've turned it into this museum, and we took our young boys. We have three little boys. They're seven, five, and three. And when you take them to things like this, you know, you, never, you think you have a great idea, and they're not interested in it last five minutes, and other things will spark their interest, and they'll be engaged for hours. Well, what they've done with this, this ship is they've turned it into this incredible museum. And we, we checked out the flight deck first. That's where all the planes are, and everything's really, really engaging. And I thought, you know, we're going to get down into the belly of the boat, and there you get to see the different functions that were happening on the boat. And to my surprise, our young kids were completely engaged and enthralled at all these different areas we looked at. We saw, you know, where the captain's quarters were. We saw where the, where the dentist would do his work. And then we saw an interesting job, the laundry man. There was a guy who was on the boat who spent pretty much every day of his life, toting around dirty laundry. That's all he did, day in and day out, uh, these 40-pound you know, duffel bags filled with dirty laundry, up and down ladders all day long, and he, he would sit there for months, months at a time performing this one task on the boat. And you had the, the total extreme of that. If you came up to the deck and you went to the tower, you had the air boss, and he was sitting controlling the deck and all the airspace around the ship, and he had a 10-mile radius view around everything. And you just look at the total difference between two people serving their function and two different views, the laundry worker day in and day out, toting around dirty laundry, doing his role, and then you have this view from the tower. And I thought it was a, an apt picture of, of the life of a Christian. We are, we are toiling in the day-to-day -day work of following Christ. We're, we're doing the, the work of the laundryman. And every once in a while, it'd be nice to come up and get a view from the tower and to see God's big plan. We have the day-to-day -day participation, but God is working out this, this eternal plan, and it's good to get a view of that from time to time. It's like the man down in the belly of the boat to set the laundry down, come up to the tower and get a peek at what's going on. And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at the, the big view of God's plan and then the day-to-day -day way that that works out in our lives. And we're going to do that in Acts chapter 13. In Acts 13, Paul is on his first missionary journey. This is the official start of the missionary endeavor. That It wasn't sparked by persecution as it was earlier in the book of Acts. And this is the first effort to send messengers deliberately beyond the boundaries of the already existing church. And our specific text today is verses 42 to 52. And, and Paul was in the city of Pisidian Antioch, and he had just preached a sermon in the synagogue. Let's read our text, and then I'll explain what we're going to do in a minute. Acts 13, verses 42 to 52. And as Paul and Barnabas were leaving, the people kept pleading that these words might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul, blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, 
Since you rejected and judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us. I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. But the Jews incited the God-fearing women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But having shaken off the dust of their feet against them, they went to Iconium. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now in this text... I want to answer a couple of questions. Two big questions. There's the why question. Why were Paul and Barnabas in this place at this time? And why would Paul at this place at this time be saying, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles? And the other question is, how did they conduct themselves now that they were in this situation? So the first question, the why, is the broader context. This this whole leading up to this point. What brought them to this place on the first missionary journey making this statement? This is the tower view on the ship. What's the big picture? Why are they here? Why are they doing this? And then the second question is, how? The how, the practical. Now that they're here, how did they conduct themselves? This is the laundry worker. This is the, this is the work that's to be done day in, day out. This is their participation in it. So what we have here is two parts to this. I'm going to give you part one, really just a long, sweeping introduction that brings us to this point in this time. Answering the why. Why are they here? Why are they doing this? And then the second part of the sermon, we'll get into the nitty-gritty of the text and see how they conduct themselves and and how we can learn lessons, how we would conduct ourselves in our day-to-day lives. So let's start part one. Why are they here? And a place that's going to help us launch back and, and bring us all the way up to this point is Luke 24. Turn with me to Luke 24. Luke 24, verse 44. At this point in Luke, Jesus has risen from the dead. He's appeared to his disciples. He's, he's eaten fish with them. And he begins to speak with them before he ascends into heaven. And he says this in Luke 24, 44. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. It says here in verse 45, he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. What Scriptures? What Scriptures would he be be opening their mind to? It'd be the only Scriptures that they would have had available to them. This is the Old Testament Scriptures. And he told them in the Old Testament Scriptures... He helped them to understand not only is it written that Christ would suffer and and die and raise again on the third day, but it is written that forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. Not only that he would suffer, die, and resurrect, but he's telling them and opening up their mind to the fact that proclamation to the ends of the earth has been the plan from the very beginning. So you imagine what scriptures was he opening up their minds to to show that his plan has been to reach the nations ever since the Old Testament. He may have, he may have taken them to the, to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12, where, where God promises Abraham, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. A covenant that he would reiterate to his son Isaac, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, Genesis 22. So before the formation of Israel, before Jacob comes and becomes Israel, before there's even a nation of Israel, the emphasis is on the ends of the earth. The nations shall be blessed. And this is repeated throughout the law. 
God had called His people out. He'd established a covenant with them, but He still cared for the nations. The nations, the sojourner, the alien. In Exodus 12, 49, Moses says, the same law shall apply to the native as to the stranger who sojourns among you. And this would, this would be reiterated throughout the law. Exodus 19, 5 says this to the people of Israel, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. A kingdom of priests. That is, each citizen a priest, a mediator between God and man to represent Him, to bring the rest of the world to Him, to be an example to, to the other nations. They were to be a holy nation, one that was set apart. The, the law was given them to make them different, to draw people to them. As Solomon is building the temple that his father couldn't build, and, and he's, he's praying to the Lord, blessing this temple, dedicating it to Him, he says this in 1 Kings 8, verse 41. Also concerning the foreigner who is not of your people, when he comes from a far country for your namesake, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays toward this house, hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name, to fear you, as do your people Israel and that they may know that this house which I have built is called by your name. And obviously we know Israel demonstrates themselves incapable of doing this. Two, three chapters later, Solomon falls and the, the kingdom is divided on their way to exile. And this is the, the picture that Christ is opening up their minds to, though. Not only in the law, he says in the Psalms. In Psalm 22, we associate as a psalm of lament, the first verse well known. Jesus utters these words on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is the way that psalm starts. But it's also a psalm of hope. Near the end of that psalm, in verse 27, it says, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the family of na families of nations will worship before you. And we have a well-known psalm that's, that is, is associated with worldwide missions, Psalm 67. And verse 4 says, Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you will judge the people with uprightness and guide the nations of the earth. But not only in the law would he have opened their minds to see that the, the nations were his concern, not only in the psalms, but in the prophets. We have numerous examples, but an easy example is the prophet Jonah sent to Nineveh, to the wicked, hated Assyrians, warning them, calling for repentance, that the, the kingdom that would ultimately drag the northern tribes into captivity. And, and the Lord says to Jonah in Jonah 4, you had compassion on the plant. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh? Jonah, you're more concerned about a plant. I care about the nations. I care about those people you call your enemy. Even the enemies of Israel. And another prophet, which is quoted in our text today, in verse 47 of Acts chapter 13, the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 49.6 says this. This is Yahweh speaking to the suffering servant. He says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nation so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Again, the Lord speaking to the suffering servant. That is Christ. And we would see the same theme carried out through the life of Christ. Not, not neglecting the Gentile, the, giving the example of the Good Samaritan, the, the woman at the well. But Jesus now, as He's appearing to them before His ascension, Thinking back to Luke 24, they're hearing what he's saying, that, that he, his name is going to be proclaimed to the ends of the earth to, for forgiveness of sins, for salvation. And they've got to be thinking, how are you going to do this? How are you going to pull this off? They're hearing his words, they're, but they're not grasping how this is going to happen. I grew up watching a, uh, a popular TV show 
uh, in the 80s. I, I, I probably watch every episode. It's the show MacGyver. I don't know if anybody's familiar with MacGyver. I'm sure some of you. I kind of start to feel old sometimes because I realize not everybody knows what that is. I'm not that old, but MacGyver. It was a big show in the 80s. And what you learned about MacGyver was after you watch enough episodes, no matter what situation he got in, he was going to find a way out of it. And it usually just involved uh, a piece of duct tape and a paper clip or something like that. So I went back and uh, watched an episode where, or I didn't watch the whole episode, but I saw a scene where he took some old beat up satellite parts and a plastic shield and turned it into a hang glider and jumps off a cliff with, with these soldiers chasing him, shooting at him. Of course, he flies eloquently through the air and lands safely on the ground. That was MacGyver. You tuned in because MacGyver always figured a way out. And they're listening to Christ before he ascends into heaven. And they had seen so much. Christ had risen from the dead. Of course, they believed him. But now he's opening up their minds to these truths. And they've got to be thinking, how are you going to do it? And that brings us into the book of Acts. And Luke continues this thought into Acts chapter 1, a well-known verse, verse 8. And Jesus says to them before his ascension, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. It's almost like he's reiterating that same idea. And what he's done, what Luke has done for us in this single quotation is he's given us the whole outline of the book of Acts. This is how the book of Acts flows. This is how God is going to take the message to the ends of the earth. He says first to Jerusalem. And what do we see in chapters 1 through 7 of the book of Acts? The gospel spreading in Jerusalem. And in chapter 7, Stephen appears on the scene. Stephen is stoned. Persecution breaks out. Where do they scatter to? Judea and Galilee and Samaria. Verse, chapters 8 through 12. The gospel is spreading. Chapter 9, verse 31 of Acts says, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace being built up. And, and we come to chapter 13. It started in Jerusalem. It spread to Judea and Samaria. And the final element of his statement is, and to the ends of the earth. And we see that from chapter 13 to the end of the book of Acts to the ends of the earth. He gives us the outline of the whole book in that one statement. And in Acts chapter 13, we come to the proclamation of the gospel to the ends of the earth. But you might be asking this question. Hasn't he already, hasn't the message already been going to the Gentiles? When Paul says in Acts chapter 13, behold, or Acts 13, 46, behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. Weren't they already bringing the message to the Gentiles? When, when Peter was preaching his sermon at the day of Pentecost, it says in Acts 2.10, 2, there were proselytes there. There were Gentiles who were converts to Judaism. We know about Acts chapter 8, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, another Gentile who he baptizes and believes. In Acts chapter 10, we have Cornelius and his whole household and the Holy Spirit coming upon the Gentiles. And in Acts chapter 11, we have these unnamed men of Cyprus and Cyrene who come to Antioch and begin proclaiming the gospel to the Greeks, to Gentiles. What do we have here in Acts chapter 13 then? We have this symbolic shift. We have the groundwork laid. The Holy Spirit had come upon the Gentiles. Peter testifies to this. But we have this point now where Luke is showing us this, this shift where he is going to emphasize that this gospel is now deliberately going to be proclaimed to the ends of the earth. And, and as we get to Acts chapter 13, walking up to that point just before our text, we see these two men, Saul and Barnabas, in the church in Antioch. Barnabas was the one who vouched for Paul at his conversion, took him to the apostles, says he was a man, of a, a good man and full of the Holy Spirit. He and Saul had ministered in the church in Antioch and even taken a gift to the church in Jerusalem. And of course, we know Saul. Saul, the, the, the one who was, who was ravaging and persecuting the church who was approaching Damascus to persecute the Christians, sees a light, is blinded, and is radically converted. And it, and it says Ananias, who, who would go to meet Paul, is told by the Lord, go for he is cho the chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. And so here we are. 
they're in this church in Antioch, and they're sent off. Acts chapter 13, verse 2. They were at the church. The Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called him. They're in Antioch, a few hundred miles north of Jerusalem, and this is the launch pad for the mission to the Gentiles. And you notice they were sent off in Acts 13, 3, by the laying on of hands. They are in the local church. They are approved by the leadership in the local church, and they are sent by the local church. It's the same thing that this church does is, is sending missionaries. The, the, every missionary here that is supported by this church, I'm confident, is tied to a local church. I am tied to a local church. Everybody here is called to be tied to a local church, and that's the example we see here. And in verse 5, as they, they head out, they first go to Seleucia, Cyprus, and Salamis, where they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues. And what we see here, again, walking up to our text, why are they here? We see Luke indicating a transition. In verse 6, we encounter a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. And in verse 7, a proconsul named Sergius Paulus. We have a Jewish false prophet, and we have Sergius Paulus, this Gentile. And, and Bar-Jesus would be blinded because it says in verse 8, he was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But ultimately, in verse 12, Sergius Paulus, this, this uh, leading Gentile, would believe, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. And Luke, again, is hinting at what is to come in our text. A Jewish rejection and a Gentile acceptance. And he does something else very interesting in, in Acts 13, 9. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, he makes that little statement. And, and oftentimes we wonder, what happened? Why, why, is, why is Saul now called Paul? Did God change his name? I, you know, you hear things in, in Sunday school. How come he's called Paul now? God didn't change his name. What we have to understand is Paul had four names. Paul was a Roman citizen. He had three names other than his Hebrew name. He would have had a praenomen. That would have been his first name. We don't know what that is. He had another name, his nomen. This would have been his family name. And he had a third Roman name, a cognomen. This would have been his given name. This was Paul. And he has this fourth name, which is his Hebrew name, Saul. So right in this verse, where a Jewish man rejects the message, a Gentile accepts it, embedded in the middle there is a little verse, and Luke says, Saul, the Hebrew name, was also known as Paul. And he's continuing to signal to us what's coming in, the, in, in these upcoming verses. And in Acts 13, uh, 13 to 14, they set sail. After this encounter with Bar-Jesus and Sergius Paulus, they set sail and arrive in Pisidian Antioch, the location of our text. And, and saw, uh, Paul at this time now steps into the synagogue and he preaches a sermon. He does what Jesus would do in his ministry. He enters into the place that would give him a hearing and he preaches a gospel message. And in, in, in verses 16 to 25, he preaches about the Old Testament promises. All of the God's providence and history of promises throughout the Old Testament. And in verses 26 to 37, he preaches that Christ is the fulfillment of all of these Old Testament promises. And then in verses 38 to 41, he invites them to believe. And he warns them against rejecting this message. And in, in verses 38 to 39, look at these with me. He gives us important message in just these two verses, the heart of his message. Verse 38, Therefore let it be known to you, brothers, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and that in him everyone who believes is justified from all things which you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. What is the message he's preaching to them? You cannot be saved through keeping of the law. Justification comes by faith alone. And this is the message that, that we'll hear throughout our text, and we will see the reaction to this message. So this, this wraps up the, the why question. Why are they there? They're there because this is God's plan from the very beginning. They're there because God has orchestrated all of the events of history to come to this point for His eternal glory. And so we have... The, how, the why answered. Now we're there. We're in Pisidian Antioch. 
They've pre- Paul has preached a sermon in the synagogue. And we have our text, verses 42 to 52. How did they conduct themselves? We've had the, the view from the tower, the big view. Now we're going to go inside the boat. How did they do it? How does this play out in our daily lives? How do we connect this message to our personal evangelism, to worldwide missions? And, and what we have to understand about missions and evangelism you know, global scale personal interactions is this. There is an engagement. There's an engagement to be had. And ultimately, there's a confrontation. And this confrontation revolves around the gospel. And that's what we see in our text. So we're going to walk through our text, and I'm going to draw, draw out four lessons for us to learn. Four lessons that are going to help us in our personal walk of personal evangelism, the way we support missions, the way we think about engaging the world. I'll just mention them briefly here and then I'll mention them again as they come up. But the first thing we do is we preach the word. Preach the word of the Lord. That's the first lesson. Secondly, we're bold in the face of opposition. Third, we trust in God's sovereignty. And fourth, we rejoice in the unstoppable work of the Lord. And again, I'm going to walk verse by verse through this and I'll just pull these out as we arrive at them. So let's work through this text. Verse 42. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. They kept begging. You imagine this picture. It's common for a pastor to stand at the door after a service is out, uh, the, as people are entering into the parking lot or the, the uh, fellowship area, and people to come up and greet him. Oh, it's a great message, pastor. Thank you for those words. You imagine this picture. When was the last time you saw somebody pleading pleading to hear more of the message that they were begging to hear more of this ongoing the idea here is that it was persistent imploring entreating this is not your typical experience for a pastor after preaching a sermon it says in verse 43 now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up many of the jews and of the god-fearing proselytes followed paul and barnabas who speaking to them were urging them to continue in the grace of God. So they're speaking here to these God-fearing proselytes, again, these these, uh, pagans, these polytheists that converted to Judaism, who had come out of multiple gods to serve the best they knew, the one true God. But they're, they're telling them, Paul and Barnabas are telling them, continue in the grace of God. They'd apparently believed and become Christians. They're telling him, don't give up on your new faith. Follow the message of grace. That you're justified by faith, as we read in verses 38 and 39. These were converts uh, to Judaism. And Jesus says, said to the Pharisees, he, he spoke words of condemnation to their efforts to make proselytes. Matthew 23, 15. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte. That's one convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. So you imagine these people hearing the message that they no longer have to be burdened by the keeping of the law. This is good news. People that believe that they were going to be justified by working uh, their efforts to keep the Mosaic law. And this is going to be the grounds of the anger and the outrage that's going to follow in our text. It's because of this. Because every other religion on the planet other than Christianity, is telling you this. You must work your way to God. There's something you must do. It, and, and when you hear this message, as somebody who is believing they're making themselves justified by God by their actions, you hear this and it kicks against the very pride of man. A prideful heart that believes they can work themselves in such a way, conduct themselves in such a way to make themselves acceptable to God. And this is what ultimately they're pushing back against. The Jews would not accept this message. They, they, they're thinking they get all of this without doing anything. And it's the reason that these, these converts would come begging for more of this message. Verse 44 says this, The next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. That's our first lesson. Our first lesson is that they preached the word of the Lord. They preached the message 
of justification by faith, that you will not be justified by keeping the law. Four times in our text, we see this come up, either the word of the Lord or word of God. Verse 44, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. Verse 46, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. Verse 48, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. Verse 49, and the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. What's the draw? Why is the whole town assembling the next Sabbath to hear Paul and Barnabas? Is it their clever tricks? Is it their ingenuity? Is it, is it an ear-tickling message? You know, it's the word of the Lord that you can be justified by faith in Christ. And ultimately, the word of the Lord divides. And that's what we see here. True gospel preaching is embraced or it's rejected. The Bible doesn't offer a third category. And that's what we see in our text here. People were either begging for the message or they were rebelling against it. And you may know somebody and you may hear people say that they are eh, kind of indifferent, take it or leave it to the gospel. The text says, we can show many places where it says that they're in rebellion against God. Ultimately, they're God-haters. They reject the message. This message divides. And that is our first lesson. We preach the word of the Lord. Verse 45, But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. This word jealousy is the same word used in the New Testament for zeal. It's the same idea of this Old Testament righteous indignation for God's house and His honor. So it can be used in a good way, but it could also be distorted or perverted. And Paul would even say this of himself in Philippians 3, 6, as to zeal, as to my zeal, a persecutor of the church. Same word. And we can, in some ways, we can appreciate the annoyance of what's happening in the synagogue, appreciate the position of the Jews there. The synagogue's practically taken over by this Gentile audience. And this unacceptable message is getting a favorable hearing by many people. And one commentator says, speaking about the Jews there, zeal for the covenant has blinded them from seeing the breakthrough of God's promise, with the result that positive zeal has become negative by cutting short the ultimate promise intended by the law. And, and Paul would say this himself of his own people in Romans 10 too. I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. This is a similar reaction that Christ would get, even preaching in his hometown, that people are astonished at him. And within a few moments, he spoke, fa speaks favorably in Luke 4 of Gentiles. And what do they want to do? Everyone is filled with rage and is outraged against him for the words he's speaking because the truth was cutting to the heart of what they held dear and the text here says that they were blaspheming that ultimately they were slandering and attacking those who were bringing the words of christ and paul would say of himself for persecuting the church he was a blasphemer in first timothy 1 13 but moving on in verse 46 how did paul and barnabas react Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. Since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. And here we have our second lesson. The first lesson was that they proclaimed the word of the Lord. And the second lesson was they spoke boldly in the face of opposition. This idea of boldness, they spoke boldly it could be rendered candor, with candor, candidly. doesn't say they uh, spoke obnoxiously. doesn't say they became angered and, and got engaged in a, a vicious argument. What it says is this. In the face of opposition, they spoke the truth. They were honest. They were unflinching, you could say. When uh, boxers are learning to fight, our instinct is, if, you know, if somebody walks up to you to punch you, your instinct is to close your eyes and to flinch and maybe protect yourself. But a boxer who's in the ring, one of the worst things he could be doing is consistently flinching and closing his eyes. He make, makes himself even more vulnerable. And, it, and it's, a, it's a natural instinct. I mean, our natural instinct in the face of opposition to the message we're giving is to flinch, is to back away, 
is to guard ourselves, is to protect ourselves. We have to be trained out of our natural sinful instinct to back away from the confrontation. We have to be trained not to blink, not to, not to blink away and shrink back when somebody opposes our message. And that's trained out of us by going to the Word of God and having it so uh, live in us and abide in us, for us being so ready to engage that we train ourselves out of our instinct to back away. We, we have to have boldness, unflinching truth in the face of opposition. And uh, quite frankly, it's easy for me to stand up here and be bold or appear to be bold. I'm in a room with, you know, friendly people who probably generally agree with what I'm saying, maybe not everybody, but I don't have anybody standing up here shouting disagreement. Don't do it if you're thinking of it. Talk to me later. But it's easy. What's difficult in your personal interactions, at, at your workplace, um, in, in places where you're not in a platform where you're protected necessarily? That's where we have to train ourselves. You know, there's no magic trick, magic pill to make you bold in evangelism. It, it's not, it doesn't exist. Every person has the same fears and you train it out of yourself. Nobody steps, steps into a boxing ring and instinctually doesn't flinch at the punches. It's the same thing. Paul says here to the Jews in our verse, it was necessary that this message be brought to them. And, and Luke doesn't really give us a reason why, but we know why this message is brought to them. The Christian message was meant to be brought to the Jews. No other people had so clear a right to hear what God had to now say. And nobody was going to be more likely to accept the message. But he says in our verse, verse 46, that they prove themselves not worthy. worthy. And we know none of us are worthy of this message, but what he's saying is, you've been given the opportunity. The rejection is at your feet. You are solely responsible for this. And behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. There's that statement, that bold statement. And, and this is the pattern you're going to see through the rest of the book of Acts. The refusal of most of the Jews, although a remnant would believe, a proclamation to the Gentiles who were going to embrace it in large numbers, usually those God-fearing, those proselytes, those, the converts to Judaism, they're going to be the seed of the early church, and they'll form the nucleus. And, and However, when Paul says this, this is not uh, some sort of new strategy he's, he's bringing up. He's going to repeat the same statement two more times in the book of Acts. He's actually going to walk into the next town, go into the synagogue, preach a message. But he's making this message very clear at this moment. He is proclaiming from this point on, this message is not exclusive. It's to all the nations. This, this message applies to every individual on planet Earth, as it always has, but he's making it abundantly clear here. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. This is not an exclusive ethnic message. In verse 47, For so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. And he makes a quotation there that I mentioned earlier, Isaiah 49, 6. And where that appears in the book of Isaiah is in the midst of, of what they call the suffering servant songs. There's four songs spoken by the suffering servant in the book of Isaiah. You're, you would be most familiar with uh, Isaiah 53, the end of 52 and 53. But out of this, the second, the second uh, suffering servant song is where this is quoted from. And the, suffering, the servant originally in uh, Isaiah 41 is spoken of as the nation Israel. And Isaiah 41 8 says, But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen. But by chapter 42, we hear that God's servant Israel is deaf and blind. By the time we get further along into Isaiah 48 and 49, we're at this climax where Israel, the nation, is not able to fulfill the task of the servant. And we come to the text in our, our the quotation in our text, I'll read the full verse, Isaiah 49, 6. He says, this is Yahweh speaking to the servant, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nation so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Again, this is Yahweh speaking to Christ. And what we have in our text is Paul taking that quotation of the Lord to the suffering servant and taking it as a command upon himself. He has so identified his ministry with the person of Christ that he's actually quoting that as a command. 
Paul and Barnabas read their own appointment to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth in the servant's commission. Christ is a light to the Gentiles as he is preached to them by his servants. This is an amazing thing, a profound thing that he's done there. And going on in verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, this statement, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Again, they're glorifying the word of the Lord, this gospel message. They become first-class believers, first-class members in God's family. No circumcision, no renouncing of their ethnic identity. You imagine the appeal of this message. And this, is the, this sees a rapid conversion at this point. And it brings us to our third lesson. They had preached the word of the Lord. They've done it boldly in the face of opposition. And thirdly, they trust in the sovereignty of of God. We trust in God's sovereignty. It says that as many as had been appointed to eternal life believe. And this word, this verb is passive. The, the idea is that as many as were arranged, assigned, ordered. And the implied actor is God. And one commentator says, just as God was the major active agent in all that led up to this point, he is the active agent in bringing the Gentiles to himself. What does this mean for personal evangelism and worldwide missions? What does it mean? It means this, that the Word of God is the means that God uses to bring sinners to repentance and faith. But God is the ultimate saver of sinners. We preach the Word of the Lord faithfully. God saves. In Romans chapter 10, verse 13, it says this, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim good news of good things. So we have our role. Proclaim the word of the Lord. It's his means for bringing people to himself. This brings us a great relief and a confidence. The relief is there's no more that I'm called to do to convert sinners except faithfully proclaim the word of the Lord as it's been given to me. And it gives me a confidence that regardless of my ability or inability, the Lord is going to save his own. John 10, 10, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. I, before going to uh, seminary uh, later in life and, and now going where we're going in ministry, I was a I worked in highway contracting and construction and earthwork and asphalt paving. and uh, Every person just about in that line of work starts off in the same place. You start off with a shovel in your hand, digging holes or ditches at the command of some foreman. And that's your job. You're not paid to know how the project's going. You're not paid to keep a budget. You're not paid to keep a schedule. You're paid to dig that hole right now and dig this ditch. There's a superintendent on the project, however, who is, is responsible for that, who's overseeing the project, overseeing the quality, the schedule, the budget. And we are simply living in God's project, in God's kingdom. He superintends everything that happens in his kingdom. And we've been given the privilege to hold a shovel in that kingdom. And our job is to dig the ditch, to dig the hole. What is that? Faithful proclamation of God's word. Doing it boldly doing it the way it's prescribed in the scriptures. And we don't stay up at night as the laborer concerned with how God is superintending his world. And we trust that he will accomplish his own will. In verse 49, the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. And this is the idea that the gospel is now being broadcast. This is the natural result of the preached gospel. It resulted in local evangelism by new converts. Right from the very beginning, the the church was self-propagating. Paul didn't go and evangelize every single individual in these towns. Not every place did he go. It would be the local body, those local core of believers would be the light to the rest of the community. God's model is organic. It's changed lives of individuals. The corporate model is flowcharts, PR, Um, marketing, branding. God's model is this, the preached word of God change hearts in the local church. And, And one convert begets another convert. 
by the faithful preaching at God's rate, God's pace, we all are participants in it. And that's the model he's given us. But in response to this, again, verse 50, the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the city. And this is the pattern we're going to see, again, throughout the rest of the book of Acts, this harassment that would follow Paul and Barnabas. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We see the pattern in the life of Christ. We see the pattern in the apostles. We see the pattern here with Paul in this particular situation. And what is their response once again? Verse 51, But they shook off the dust of their feet and protest against them and went to Iconium. They shake the dust from their feet. This, this is what Jewish travelers would have done when they were leaving a pagan town. And this action is now treating the, the synagogue there as if they were pagan. And you remember this when, when Jesus uh, commissioned the disciples to go out in Mark 5. He says, any place that does not receive you as you go out, shake the dust off the soles of your feet as a testimony against them. This is highly symbolic. This is, this is the idea that they are identifying them now as, a, as pagans. And there's this new identification of the people of God, no longer simply identified by race. And, the, and it says in verse 52, our last verse, and the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And that brings us to our fourth and final lesson. They preached the word of the Lord. They were bold in the face of opposition. They, they trusted that God saved sinners. They trusted in the sovereignty of God. And finally, they rejoiced in the unstoppable work of the Lord. The word of the Lord is spreading, we see. The, a church is planted despite major obstacles. The progress of God's church cannot be stopped. Matthew 16, 18. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. So they're persecuted. They have violent opposition against them. And their response is rejoicing. And we think of that in our own lives. And when we face the slightest opposition, the slightest difficulty, what is our inclination? Our inclination is usually not to rejoice. But we see these people and this, in these unbelievably hostile circumstances rejoicing. Even though many of them would give up everything they had, they had seen, you remember at the beginning, they were pleading for this message, begging for more of it because it freed them from the bondage of working their way to God. And so in our own lives, we, we have these four simple principles, lessons we can pull out of here. How do they conduct themselves? Well, we preach the word of the Lord. We're not clever. We're not inventive. We're not novel in our approach. It's given to us in the scriptures. And when we're opposed, we come back with the truth. We don't flinch. We're not, we don't engage with hostility. We resist with boldness in the truth. And then we trust that the Lord's going to sort everything out in His way. And regardless of what happens, we're left with this message. Rejoice. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. You can participate as a, a ditch digger in God's kingdom. Let's close. I'm going to read Revelation 7, verses 9 to 12 as we close. You can turn there if you want. Revelation Chapter 7, verse 9 says this, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. The blessing and the glory and the wisdom and the thanksgiving and the honor and the power and the strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, thank you for this message. Help us to accept our role, our clear role, in our participation in your kingdom, we proclaim Jesus Christ crucified and risen and that through faith in him, rebellious sinners can be reconciled to a holy God. Help us to be happy ditch diggers in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.